All good. Well, welcome everybody. So nice to see all your lovely familiar faces. Um, I would like to introduce you all to Elizabeth Ivers, who is our featured artist for December 2023. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce um, Elizabeth and tell you a little bit about her background, and then I will give it over to Elizabeth to give her talk and show some images. Um, okay, so with that, why don't we get started? Here we go. Okay. Elizabeth Ivers grew up in West Texas, went to college in New Mexico and Wisconsin, and currently lives in Madison, Wisconsin. Her relationship with the Leo Marshute School began in 1979 when she saw a poster about the school on Dean Haggard's office door at St. John's College in Santa Fe. In the fall of 1979, she left for France and a year-long study at the school. After attending the school, Elizabeth graduated from St. John's and eventually received an MS from the University of Wisconsin's Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Over the years, while working in the natural resources field, she has continued to paint. Although she hasn't returned to X since 1980, we might have to try to fix that soon, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, her occasional contact with former classmates and teachers has provided support over the years. Excuse me. Elizabeth is a member of the Wisconsin Visual Artists and the Wisconsin Watercolor Society and is currently represented by the Garver Gallery. She has participated in regional and national exhibits and her work is held in private collections as well as the permanent collections of the UW Hospital and the Racine Art Museum. In the coming year, she and her husband will be relocating to Southwest Colorado. Hmm. I forgot um, so I included that. that. <laughs> you did. <laughs> so with that, I will turn things over to Elizabeth um, to give her talk. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm more nervous than I thought I would be. I have not tried to do a presentation like this on Zoom, so please bear with me. Um, as Rose said, um, I first heard about the school from Dean Haggard, and he and his then wife, Gail Haggard, were big supporters of Leo and the school. And they were very supportive and showed me, uh, talked to me about the school and showed me works by um, the, they had a number of, of lithos of Leo's, and I was very moved by his work. And so I, I should have said that <clears throat> at the end of my junior year at St. John's, I wanted to study the visual arts and wasn't sure where to go. So this gave me some good ideas and I decided to go to X in the fall of 1979. Um, excuse me, I've had a cold recently, so I'm a little bit hoarse. Um, there were so many things about the school that were so wonderful uh, to experience. The beauty of X, um, the beauty of the Provencal landscape, um, the camaraderie among the students was wonderful. I was there at a time when um, there was several really amazing students and um, they, the being at the school started friendships that lasted afterwards and <laughs> provided a lot of support after I left. Um, daily painting sessions, the seminar discussions, um, wonderful writings on art. But the thing that was most compelling to me it, were the, the teachings of Leo and uh, the central teachings on art, the, the idea that selection is important to the unity of a work, that the relationship of colors and values create the volume or form in a work and that these core qualities in a work could be found in um, paintings across the century whether it was works by Giotto or Titian or Goya or Rembrandt or Pizarro that there was this core um, um, core quality of volume and light in a work that, that, that uh, was a commonality among these works. <clears throat> and what was amazing to me was that after 
um, months of painting and looking at works um, and discussing them in seminar and seeing them in museums, <clears throat> um, this idea of volume and light in a work and form was something that I saw. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was just an abstract idea that somebody verbally told me. It was something that I came to see and was convinced by through my eyes. And that um, sensibility and that core teaching was something that stayed with me throughout my, um, throughout my life and my efforts at, at painting. I haven't always succeeded at, in realizing it in my own work, but I've, I've, I've striven to, to, to work towards those principles in my own work. <clears throat> So um, with that, I thought I would show you some of my work, uh, kind of a sampling. Um, I feel quite ancient, so, um, but I will show you some work from over the years. You're not that ancient. They said. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So um, let me do the share screen here. <clears throat> um, oh, here we go. Can you folks see that? Yes, Everybody looks great. Okay? All right. Lovely. <laughs> like I said, um, I had painted a lot in high school. I'd always painted in watercolor. So it was a medium that was really natural to me. And working with the white of the surface as the light in a work came naturally having worked in watercolor. So that was something that felt very familiar to me when I arrived at the Marshute School. <clears throat> And one of the things that I really enjoyed about the program was that um, we worked from nature in a variety of ways, including the model and portrait studies and still lives. I think the thing that I enjoyed the most was working from <clears throat> landscapes. Um, this is one of my favorite works from that year. This one um, I included, it's it's part of a small group of paintings that I did late one afternoon. And um, <laughs> um, I don't know how successful any one painting was, but I, the experience that afternoon has really stayed with me. Um, I did a number of very quick sketches and I remember the intensity of the feeling of looking at nature of sort of the through line between my brush my eyes and what I was seeing and um, I just felt like I was kind of in a trance and that was such a wonderful intense uh, experience I'd never had that before and it's something that I continue to uh, try to have when I when I paint. Um, in the spring um, I painted in oils for the first time and <laughs> had a really good trip to Venice um, I was looking at these two paintings a couple of years ago and, I, and it occurred to me that they really represent um, uh, kind of two directions that my work sometimes goes. Sometimes it's quieter and calmer, like the, the painting from Giadeca on the left. Sometimes it's more all at once, like the fish market on the right. And, and I've kind of gone between the two. Sometimes it depends upon the subject and my state of mind. The other thing that was obvious about this work is the presence of the sky, which <clears throat> has been a, um, a feature of a lot of my painting. Um, after I came back um, from France, <laughs> I had had this idea when I was in France, things went so well and I thought, it'll just keep going up and up and up and up. And, you know, I'll just, just I, I envisioned this step ladder that I would just keep going up. And when I came back to, back home, it really felt like I fell off a cliff. It felt like my, 
I lost my sense of color. Um, I sometimes painted in really pale colors. My conception was off and on. It was very up and down. Sometimes I would paint something and it would really click and come together. And other times I, I yeah, go several weeks and nothing would happen. It was very, very frustrating. And this went on much longer than I would like to admit. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure why I continued working, but I did paint a few things that I liked in the, in the subsequent years during my 20s. A number of them I gave away and did do a good job of making images. So but there's a few things I can show you from that period. This is something that I did when I went back to St. John's, a study of an arroyo and sky in New Mexico. I stayed on after I graduated. And one of the things I worked on were monoprints um, which I really, I don't know if you can um, see both of these. Um, it's a, it's a, I didn't have a printing press. I simply used a glass plate and oil paint and a roller. And I really liked the, the kind of uh, uh, light that you could get from, from working in monoprints. This is something, this is a little oil painting I did <laughs> on a long trip to Big Bend National Park, um, which is in far southwest Texas, beautiful area. <clears throat> I also continued to work in watercolors. Um, as you can see, they were often very spare. <laughs> Some of them are so spare, I didn't even try to um, include them because of, they're very hard to see. This one is of Shiprock, which is a formation in Northwest um, New Mexico. And um, this is one of the first things I did completely from imagination. I was just trying to capture the sense of curvature in the earth and the way that storm clouds move across the mountains in the distance out west. It's, it's a mo type of motif that I love. And um, I just, I, I was just trying to capture a, a little bit of the feeling of that. I'm gonna skip over a number of years. When I came up to Wisconsin, I worked, I did a number of paintings of farm landscapes. For a while, I concentrated uh, primarily on florals. I was trying to get more richer color into my watercolors because they'd gotten so pale. And then at one point I started concentrating more on sky and water studies. I went over to Lake Michigan and painted a number of things from there. I also did more paintings from out west from our travels. This is um, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, just south of Santa Fe. And as I continued to work in oils, I got, as you can see, <laughs> looser and looser. Um, these three are from observation. These two are from imagination. I was just trying to get that feeling of space and energy um, that I see in the lake. I also continued doing oils from our travels. Um, this, are the, this is a painting of the Ortiz Mountains south of Santa Fe. And these are the Jemez Mountains, um, kind of west of Santa Fe. I made several trips to New Mexico during this period. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Wow. Um, this is, we started traveling out to the Tetons, and I don't know if you've ever been to the Tetons, it's just a beautiful line of mountains, and they shoot straight up from the valley floor, and they're just, yeah, I've done a lot of studies, still haven't captured the feeling of them, uh, beautiful, beautiful group of mountains. These are, as you can see, my watercolors continue to be pretty spare. Um, these are all from imagination. I, I reached a point where I could, I had internalized the, the shape of the mountains and I wanted to just do a series of works that captured the way the clouds move across um, the mountains and the different light. 
Um, shiprock continued to be of interest to me. These are a couple of oils. And um, I also did some sepia studies. I always had a lot of problems uh, working with pencil. It, it always felt a bit stiff to me and kind of um, working with a brush and uh, wash always felt a lot more natural to me. And this is, I did a number of sepia studies during this period of different landscapes. And these are a couple of, of studies of shiprock. Another thing I like about the West is when you get up into the mountains and you can see for miles. And this was done, I did a sketch from, from when we uh, took a backpacking trip up into the Tetons and later did an oil painting from that. And this is from Grand Mesa, which is close to where we are going to move. So I'll get to go. It's an uh, area called Land's End, and you just kind of come to the end of this cliff and you see out across the landscape. It's just gorgeous. And it gets all kinds of crazy skies across it. This, this little study is it's, uh, just, again, from imagination. I started doing more and more things from imagination, just having looked a lot at the landscape and its skies and the way the sky moved across the landscape. Um, I just, this was one of the things that I did just from imagination, trying to capture that feeling. Um, I, I didn't say at the beginning that um, since you're here and I haven't, I, my, my life as a painter is pretty solitary. So some of the questions I have, I don't have a lot of opportunity to talk to other artists. I do know a few people in the area, but you you folks have the same language that I do. So um, I, was, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask a few questions. And I've, I've got a couple of questions at the end of the slideshow, but this is a little more simpler a, a question that I have. And I know when we, at the school, we talked a lot, a, a lot about the importance of working from nature. Having now come back and worked from a specific landscape, and as Rose said at the beginning of the program, I grew up in West Texas, <clears throat> which is very flat country, very open, um, huge presence of the sky. And I included this family portrait. Um, my folks built several teepees. And when I was a little girl, we would uh, every summer we would head off for vacation into the mountains and uh, areas of the West, some of the canyon country in Utah. And so what was kind of instilled in me as a child was that landscape and it's in its shape to some degree, what I'm drawn to and some of the way I conceive la landscape. And that's led me to ask, kind of a, a broader question of <clears throat> how particular landscapes shape a painter's work. Um, I mean, it's more a little more obvious with a, a landscape artist. I mean, if you think of Cezanne, for me, it's kind of hard to imagine him painting any other, the way he painted any other place except near Mont Sec Victoire and the, that landscape around X. Um, I wonder about Kokoschka. Um, I know it, it seems like his painting really opened up in the 1920s when he started traveling around Europe and seeing, you know, broad cityscapes and that kind of affected his idea of what, what did he call it? Bipolar perspective, where you look down and you look out. Um, Goya is another example, which you know, his work involved more of the <clears throat> culture and the political realities of the time when he was painting. I don't know, is, have any of you had the experience of a particular landscape shaping either your palette or the way that you paint? Nope. <laughs> 
And I'll just remind everybody that you're automatically on mute when you join the call. So if you want to say something, go ahead and unmute yourself. And that button should just be at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself to be able to talk. Is there anything that comes to mind? I, I had helps. a few experiences along those lines. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I... Uh, started a series when I quit doing landscapes in the 90s in X and I traveled to Antigua and I did some both some landscapes and some still ice down there but the colors were totally different uh, to the point that even now in those paintings I title them Caribbean or Antigua and the same thing when I got to uh, where was it the other place that the oh I know I went and visited Billy in Costa Rica Oh, and, huh. and the, uh, as when I came back, I was working on that large series of the uh, um, Miro or the Paul Clay, rather the the, the okay. uh, sunrise, uh, that very abstract thing. Um, and I did a series with the harmonies with very very subtle green harmonies from Costa Rica. Um, hmm. That's my only experience. Of well, I've wondered, I've wondered, uh, Sam, about it seemed to me that when you when you went from France to the Caribbean, that there was this richer color. I don't know if you were going in that direction anyway, or whether the uh, living in the Caribbean brought out a stronger sense of color. Or do you think it was just a different palette? No, I think it was, I was further along the path, the path, because when I went to Antigua, I mean, I did still lifes as well, but I also did a lot of landscape there, really a lot of landscape. So I was back in front of nature. Um, right. And I think that I had gained from the experience of working in the studio and strengthening my colors, because my colors okay. were washed out in, in nature. Uh, and little by little in the studio, I was able to strengthen those colors. So when I went back at, out in the landscape, I had more courage to use the stronger colors. I think it was timidity that led me to such sort of little delicate stuff before. So okay. that's huh. my guess. Yeah. I mean, painters are influenced by a lot of different things. I don't mean to suggest that there's any sort of direct correlation, but it is a, a question for me. I remember, I remember one afternoon we were we were coming back from having painted out in the landscape and in the, the old bus that we had that you had at the time. And <clears throat> and everybody was lined up on either side of the bus. And and somebody said, you know, there's a Susan landscape, there's an Elizabeth landscape, there's a Jim landscape, there's a you know, uh, a, a sandy landscape. Everybody at that point that you could start to see um, there were different um, different motifs that people were drawn to and why that is, whether it's um, something that, that, that affected us when we were children and growing up, is it something that, um, later in life we're influenced by, or maybe a, another painter that inspires us. Um, for me, there's something about the reality of the Western landscape that, that really has affected me pretty strongly, for better or worse, but it's there. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just a question that's been on my mind for a while that I thought I would throw out there. So well, let me go on. Um, so I should say at this point, I, I went through some pretty serious health problems and wasn't able to paint for a while. And one of the things I had difficulty with was uh, I had a really bad tendon injury to my dominant hand. And uh, coming out of that, I decided that um, I would just concentrate on watercolors because oil painting took so much, it was just hard mixing colors with this hand and uh, took more commitment. So from this point on, um, I've, for the last 
10, 15 years, I've worked primarily, well, only until very recently, I started monkeying around with a little bit of oil, but mostly, mostly watercolor. Um, let me move on. So um, coming out of this, one of the subjects that interested me and it always interested me was were skies. And as you can see, I finally started getting, um, I was able to work with a little deeper color. And uh, um, so one of the, like, as I said, um, I really enjoyed the challenge of, of working with a little more abstract uh, subject like skies. Um, I've always been a, uh, a, I've always really enjoyed Constable's work on skies and have always been very inspired by. This group were a little bit more recognizable as sky. Some of them that I worked on <clears throat> got a little bit more abstract. This is inspired by an evening sky, but it's it's pretty abstract. It's one of my favorite, uh, mm -hmm. as well as this one. Mm -hmm. Other subjects that I concentrated on were things mm -hmm. in in the Madison area, like the wow. the lakes, <clears throat> the skyline from Lake Lake Monona. I <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> I live on an isthmus between two lakes, uh, two large lakes, and uh, I've regularly painted from them and also worked on <laughs> sunsets from Lake Mendota, which is on the other side. This is actually from Washington Island, which is um, up off of, it's an island north of Door County. And that was on a, a trip, a vacation we took. I've also, also worked from the farm landscapes around Madison. This is a, one of the better summer studies. Um, this is a study done in fall near Horicon, Horicon Marsh. Mm. Um, one of my visits over to Lake Michigan, there was a big storm and I saw I love the way the clouds and the waves worked. And um, I came back and did a, a kind of, from imagination, from my memory of that, tried to do some studies of that. This one on the right is complete, just another imaginative study. Um, at one point, mm. I started playing around with watercolor and I just, uh, it's hard for me to describe. I I wanted to I wanted to paint some more abstract studies that just express the space and energy I see in the sky and the land, or sky and the water. Um, and so I did a series of works. For the lack of a better word, I call them imaginings. Um, here's a. All of these are about half sheet size of watercolor, about 15 by 22 or so. And I just wanted to get this kind of sense of space and ethereal light that I sometimes feel in the landscape. Also during this period, I was doing a lot of, I'm sorry, does somebody have a question? Um, I was doing a lot of. I, uh, I, would love to, I would love to pipe up and say that that previous one, the one that you showed, the just yeah, that one reminds me of images from the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> so if okay. you were going for space, I think you hit a home run on that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think Sam found some of these a little too gray for his palette, but. Um, I do love my grays. You have to be careful, but <laughs> I love the I love the work I'm seeing here. Do really. you? Yeah, but, but I must say the stronger the, the stronger ones I like better than the what do you call them uh, a, a little dis, a little too discreet or something. But I like the stronger ones better. But I think it's marvelous work. Thank you. During this period, I was also 
doing a variety of landscapes from out west, some successful, some not, from a variety of places. The Tetons continue to be of interest to me. Um, this is from Southern Utah. This is from a morning study from Death Valley. Um, <laughs> as Sam and, and Alan know and John, <laughs> big skies have been uh, uh, um, something that have, I've always been inspired by. <clears throat> and this is an image inspired by a landscape in New Mexico. And these two are from uh, a road trip in Nevada. Um, I said early on that um, sometimes I try to do quieter studies and sometimes more dynamic all at once studies. And um, the idea of, of what's the line from the four quite quartets still but still moving sometimes my efforts have just ended up being too static um this group of works from the great salt lake i was pretty pleased with i i felt like i captured some of the um it's just a beautiful area um the reflections and the stillness in the lake are just mm -hmm. extraordinary. The feeling of it. Beautiful. Successful. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly got it. Beautiful, my God. Yeah. And I think the yeah. line you're looking for is, uh, what is it? Um, a still point in a turning world, right? Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You you've, like you've managed. Sam, you've managed to do that, capture that stillness in some of the work you've been doing recently. And of course, Leo was able to do it to extraordinary degree um, in, in some of his figurative works. Um, although I'm primarily drawn to big landscapes, I do occasionally do more um, intimate studies and um, Blossoming fruit trees were something that I painted for the first time when I was in France, and I've continued to come back to it from time to time when I have the opportunity. Um, I mentioned that I, for a while, worked on florals, um, and that's a subject that I've come back to as well. <clears throat> Not as often lately, but when my body completely breaks down and I'm not able to get out in the landscape, I'll probably just devote myself to, to uh, flowers from the garden. I won't succeed like you do, Sam, but I'll give it a try. Um, when I, we took a trip to Zion National Park and I really loved the way the light and shadow worked with lizards. And it's a subject I want to try to get back to. I think, I think I could do a little bit more, um, a little bit more vivid rendition of this subject. But it's it's something that that really interests me. Okay, um, you guys, I have, <laughs> I'm not sure what to tell you about uh, this group of paintings. Um, starting, I think it was 2016. I was looking up at the sky through the trees and saw this vertical strip of sky. And I thought I could put that over, imagine it over water. And I started doing these vertical studies. As you've seen, I usually express space with more of a horizontal. And I did this whole group of vertical um, kind of what I call sky and water studies. And what they really became were um, color harmony. Um, um, I, I just kind of went crazy with a crazier with color. My, my palette tends to be a little bit grayer, which is influenced by the landscapes I look at. But um, this was kind of a fun series to do to just allow a certain amount of freedom with color. Like, I mean, I usually don't deal with a lot of pinks like 
the the image on the left but and also i continued with you know experimenting with different sky ideas so yeah it was a bit of a tangent and i'm not it just kind of happened and i'm not quite sure what to think of it um, nice tangent i'm sorry yeah. lovely tangent. beautiful tangent <laughs> Well, it taught me some additional things about color and and also the medium of the watercolor. Um, I continued to, I think, gain more confidence with, with watercolor. One of the subjects that's interested me is lightning and the energy of lightning. These are two earlier studies, uh, much grayer in, in color. And then more recently, <laughs> um, I, I just started playing around one day and did one painting right after another, all from imagination, just playing with the idea of lightning and the energy in the landscape. And the other thing that I've played with more in the last couple of years is the combination of line with wash, um, either pencil line or watercolor crayon. And um, so um, these, I was hoping that Hillary Stein would be here, which is part why I included these two. Well, this one particularly, this is Elk Mountains. She lives in this valley in here. <laughs> so I thought she might, might recognize it. Um, this is from uh, a trip last year, uh, or actually both of these. This is Blanca Peak on in the southeast corner of uh, Colorado. Many we'll of tell her my... you shouted her out. We'll she'll watch the recording. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we'll give her a heads up. <laughs> Many of my travel studies have gotten wilder and wilder. Like I said, I'm I seem to be doing a more combination of lime with wash um, in the combination of the two. And um these, this is the last, uh, I told you earlier on that sepia wash feels more comfortable to me and it did for years. And I don't know why I don't, sometimes you, it's hard to explain where your hands and eyes take you, but <clears throat> I started doing a bunch of charcoal drawings this fall and <laughs> they got wilder and wilder, but um, <clears throat> these are a couple of, of watercolor studies from around Madison and and these are charcoal studies from this fall so so that's my last image and so I've got a couple of big questions for you guys um, the first one is about distance um, and space in a in a painting I said in my write-up for me um, space is a really essential part of the visual arts, just in the same way that time is an important part of music. And I've quoted, I've quoted Chris Coffey here. I, I, I have a question about the way he put this. And of course, he's not here to defend himself, but in his write-up, he wrote this. This is for me one of the greatest lessons from Cezanne, who in the 19th century single-handedly ushered us into the era of truly modern painting by demolishing perspective and breaking down distance for better and alas, worse. Matisse, whose work I love, went even further. It seems to me he's suggesting that truly modern painting must, um, um, if, it, if it's to be truly modern painting, it has to demolish perspective and break down distance. And one question I have about that, um, 
I mean, I think of painters from the 20th century like Kokoschka and Giacometti and Anselm Kiefer and some Americans that I'm aware of. Um, Kokoschka, of course, just an incredible sense of space. Giacometti, I remember when we went to the, didn't we go to the Met Museum the first week of the school year? Do you remember that, Alan or John? Is it the museum Met? Do I have that? Am I pronouncing that correctly? A Met? Yeah. 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 Met. Yes, the year, Met. Right. Donald the King. Yes. I, I remember the first time I saw, it was at that museum, which was the first time I'd ever seen a Giacometti. And I was, I was, I was just blown away by mm -hmm. the, the portraits <clears throat> that I saw that had this sense of enormous space around the individual. And something about that would just, just um, sent me humming. I just loved it. I think there are different ways to interpret that sense of space around his figures and his portraits. But for me, it's a very powerful aspect of his work. So yes. I'm a, in general, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea that the visual arts necessarily must go in one direction or another. Um, do you folks have any, any uh, ideas about this or thoughts? Well, isn't uh, Cezanne, you know, he's a classic painter, so I feel like maybe it's a, incomplete to say demolishing perspective. I mean, I think that he must have meant, I don't know, I can't, I can't say, but the academic perspective and bringing it back to the, the human sensory perspective, as in, you know, how things were before the renaissance um and you know they nailed it back back in the day all the way from you know um chinese paintings to Cezanne, you know so that's right i'm john by the way <laughs> hi how are you how are yeah. you i've i've as you can see i've included a couple of <clears throat> this painting here both of these are are by forgive my pronunciation yu chan <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> I think you guys are probably pretty familiar with this one, maybe less so this one. This is an absolute favorite of mine. I mean, he could have eliminated the boat and I would have been perfectly happy. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I love, one of the things I love about the visual arts is <laughs> on a flat surface, you can have two different values and two marks and they set up, they create a space. And to me, that's just an astonishing thing. And it's a wonderful thing about the visual arts. Um, and I, I guess I'm not ready to let go of that. <laughs> um, I, I think there's some wonderful, it does seem to me that <clears throat> Sam, you and, and Francois have moved in a, in a more of a direction of a flattening of space. Um, but, whoops, sorry. Um, but, um, I don't know. Sam, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> Is he still there? <laughs> Nothing spontaneous, thank you. It's getting a little deep here, and so I'm more reflecting than having any thoughts. Okay. I don't want to open my mouth right now. I might make a fool of myself. Um, but I'm very interested by what you're saying, and you know. You can just... see why I present these questions, and they've been on my sure. mind for a while. So, um, yeah. So, Elizabeth, can I can I say something about your work? Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure how to take on Chris's statement. You know, that's a big. There's a lot there to actually talk. Sure. About. Of sure. words in there, you know, depending on what he meant, but I just want to talk about your work. Sure. For me, oftentimes, not all the time, but a lot of times, uh, many times, when people come over and they work in the Marshall School, 
and they do these incredible things and then they go back to the United States and they start working and then a few years later I'm like oh no what happened <laughs> what happened to what they learned over here okay and when I look at your work what I'm really astounded by is what you learn in, in those early watercolors you know if we if I looked at the early watercolors that you did in X, I could almost say, oh, those first two watercolors, I was almost like, whoa, are those Sam Sam watercolors or are those her watercolors? And there's sort of a, there's an influence there. And you went back to the United States and actually found an incredible personal uh, originality, I think, that your works in the sky and the things that you did later on when you came back to the United States, actually go a lot further than what you did over here in the act. You made it something really original, which is actually very related. I think you put up these two images. I think your work actually relates much more to these two Japanese images that you put up than say, Cezanne, right? Um, <laughs> At least that's what I think. And, and also, I think in your work, what I find interesting when I was looking at the two Jap these two works, are they Japanese or Chinese? I'm not Chinese. Sure. These, yeah. Chinese. I think 12th century, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, go ahead. I also find in, in your watercolors, the skies are always like really incredible. And the water is always really incredible. And sometimes I feel like in the in the watercolors, the land when you do land, you don't uh -huh. have the same, you don't have the same abstraction or the same feeling. I don't know. You have to go back and look. But sometimes I feel like your you know your sky paintings that you do that are just skies <clears throat> are so incredible. They're very original. You know, they're not related. You, you can see your influences. Yes, they're they're probably in. We could think about a lot of different paintings, painters that those paintings relate to, but they're mm -hmm. very personal. They're very original. You know, they're not sort of Leo Marshutes. You can see that if I looked at those paintings, I could say, oh God, maybe she went to the Marshutes school, but it's not totally obvious because they're so original. They're beautiful. What you've done in the landscape. And I think that landscape you, that you love has really affected the form of your paintings in a really powerful way. They're beautiful, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I, I do, I will say that in some of my work, I go crazy in the sky and then I tighten up in the land. And in some of my work, it's gotten tighter um, and I've had to work to try to loosen up. So I would agree with what you, you said about that. I think more recently, I'm getting much looser, which I'm very happy to see. And I'm hoping to, to return to oil painting and be able to translate some of those, some of those kind of sketch-like things, uh, travel sketches that I showed you are looser things and, and translate that back into oil painting. We'll see, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, in the best ones, the, the land to the sky and the mountain in the distance work, you know, but I just think okay. in some of them, and all most of the time your water, right, is just incredibly exquisite in relation to what you're doing in the sky. And a lot of times in the land to the sky, it's exquisite too, but just sometimes it seems like you would agree like, with okay. you. Let me get by this so I can get up to what I'm really interested in. <laughs> can we go back to your water? On... The like you said, sorry, during the this way I'll back, go back. Then, you mentioned you got back into oil and then you said no, that, that looser lake. and it was a lot well, of marine. It was like it was mini <laughs> back. Sorry, I'll it was uh, back. like four okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> Which ones did you want? Go, go. Um, Is that land? Hold on. I, I hang on. There's two of you here. John, which ones do you want to see? Who's in charge? Well, the ones I was talking about, I want to look at all of them because they're amazing. Uh, but I was talking about 
pretty far back. It was, okay. it was right. You'd said like you've gone back to oil after watercolor, mm -hmm. but it, it was like maybe middle of the slideshow. And there Actually, four, I've gone from four uh, seascapes. Let me, okay. So at this point, keep going. John, okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Keep going. Oh. Um, yeah. Was that it? Uh, so, so, um, I those are beautiful. I just mentioned that I, um, totally um beautiful. around Gorgeous. 2007 8, I ran into a lot of health issues, and that's when I had the tendon injury. So, that's when I transitioned to just focusing on watercolor, and it was mm -hmm. for a number of years in he in the 2000s, I had uh. I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction here. Um, I had worked so sorry. Beautiful. Um, and I would like to stop. You go back. <laughs> go back. Right. Uh, yeah. Lovely. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs so their own Zeta, control button. Zeta, if you go back to the one, go back to the one before this one. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. I yeah. Did you have a question, John? I um I did I more was just an observation, but it exists in all these paintings, so it really doesn't matter. Um they're amazing. I was, I'm always, not always, but I've had this debate with my partner um, about paintings of sky and um, how there needs to be an, a reference to, you know, in terms of depth and um, perspective, there needs to be some sort of reference to solidity or the ground or um, the artist, the viewer. But to go off what Alan's saying, I'm just blown away in your paintings of just exclusively clouds, there, there's, I, I think there is a reference to sensation, but there's no land and it's just unbelievable um, to create such a sense of that still point in a turning world. Um, it's just really admirable. I'm inspired. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful. <laughs> I mean, that's, Elizabeth, yeah, for me. That, it's really Thank you. My un Elizabeth. Yes. Yes. For me, this is a good comparison in terms of what I was talking about. I mean, we can go forward and see other ones, but I I feel like, for example, in these two images, the image mm -hmm. on my right, the one with the green foreground, the greener foreground. Yeah. Uh the land there and how that relates to what you do up in the sky is totally incredible to me okay that there's a relationship there in terms of how you wanted to do the sky and how you did the land in relation to the main subject part sort of getting through the land up into the sky is really incredible and the one on the left i don't feel that is i almost feel like the you've got a tension there between what's happening in front and the sky are sort of two different elements a little bit, just comparatively between the two mm -hmm. images, both wonderful, but. Uh, oh, okay. Find that. And so if I block out the foreground in the one on the left, that beautiful, incredible light that you get coming in the sky in relation to the mountain, mm -hmm. fuller to me. Okay. The one on the right seems much more one thing, you know. Okay. But in the end, all I want to say is what you're doing in the skies are really incredible and original. Well, thank you. I think. It, I, I remember Dean telling me that when Sam came through Santa Fe, he complained that there were no verticals. Obviously, for me, <laughs> the verticals... Yeah. The sky provides the verticals. It has a whole personality of its own. 
and uh, uh, you know, it's just different ways of looking at the landscape and and what you're affected by. But that's yeah. Um, yeah. So can you, Did you give us wrong attachments to the? <laughs> say again, John. I was going to say, did you have, I'm sure you did, a strong attachment to your native Texas um, landscape when you were young? I think if I went back to Odessa, it would feel pretty, just a little too flat and nondescript. I mean, it's very flat mesquite country. <clears throat> but um, the sparseness of the vegetation, the openness of the landscape, that's that I think has stayed with me because I don't like environments where I'm closed in. I mean, forests are okay for a short while, but I really like to be in an open space. In Wisconsin, being out in prairies or some of the hilltops overlooking farm landscapes give me some of that same feeling. But when I go out west, it just I just feel at home. Um, some people like my my mother-in-law my husband's mom um, grew up in Ithaca and she loves kind of steeper hills, forested green environments. Uh, that's what she, she knows. And if she goes out West, she feels very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's partly what you know and what you've been around um, um, or what you grow to love later on. I mean, these things, and the same landscape can affect two people in very different ways. For, for me, I've grown to love, <clears throat> I love landscapes where I can see mountains in the distance and there's all this crazy stuff going on in the sky and the, and the foreground and the way they meet at the horizon. That would be my absolute favorite landscape. Um, if you have Marin Robinson on, she goes out west and a lot of her work has to do with, she's very drawn to vertical cliffs. She recently moved to New Mexico and, and she drove north to these tall cliffs that are, that are in northern New, New, Mexico, New Mexico. So whereas I go for the horizontal, she goes much more for the vertical and you'll see um, and when she, if she ever does a presentation, you'll see more of her work and that's what her eye is drawn to. So um, yeah, the mystery of it is, is yeah, <laughs> it's, it's interesting why, why we're drawn to such different things. Yeah. Did you want me to go forward or backward or I guess we're getting close to the end here. Can we just look at those lake water cut the, the lake the Go more forward. imaginative studies or, or uh, the, no. the oils those, those are beautiful salt lakes. those are beautiful wow those, those are incredible. beautiful wow look at that yeah see uh, uh, wait yeah alan i'm sorry you you wanted to see what which ones well i wanted to see the lake ones i'm not exactly the salt sure lake Salt Lake one? The, the oils or uh, keep, go those? See, just keep going now. Or the watercolors? The watercolors. So these are the... Those. Uh, oh. Keep going. That's incredible. All of that. Wow. That. that Stop. One. The one before. The Great Salt Lake. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. I find that really beautiful in terms of how you've uh, rendered the quality of the water and, the, uh, the and I, I felt pretty good about trying to suggest delicate detail without becoming too detailed if you know what I mean just trying to find that it's something that Turner achieved which he just blows me away where he He'll suggest fine detail in the environment and in his watercolors, but it doesn't become overly detailed. Well, it sometimes does, but for the most part, no. Um, and I, I just really admire that, his ability to find that balance. Yeah. Now, can yeah. you go back? Can you go 
back a few. <laughs> sure. Just the, I just want to, because I think it's interesting. Keep going to like little right stop. Whoops. Right. See, like those, I really find them so incredibly wonderful because they're like Constable and Turner together in terms of a new thing. You know, they're not Constable and they're not Turner, but you know, they're almost those two feeling together that makes a new feeling. I really love the, yeah, for that reason, you know, they're very particular and original. Thank you. Thank you. What I like about this is that the whole thing for over 50 years, there's an evolution and a constancy of vision. Whereas some of the people we've seen go out and make a intellectual decision. I'm going to do try this, or I'm going to try that, uh -huh. which is stuff coming from the outside in. Yeah, and I think the thing that we've always felt them that the, you certainly Leo's evolution is the best example of it is the work evolves from the internal need of the artist and the consistency of his, of his vision, not his intellectual thinking out some new theory of painting or, or even thinking out where I ought to go. In other words, I just follow my eyes to know where I'm going. That's that's what yeah. I see with this, and I, yes. I think it's marvelous. Yeah. yeah. Tell you the truth, um, <laughs> I shouldn't cry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I've, I mean, I feel like I sh I'm where where I am today is where I should have been when I was in my 30s, and I've been so slow at progressing. And um, so it's been very frustrating at times, but uh, I just try to keep going forward. And, um, but I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying, what all of you are saying. I, I really appreciate it. It's very That's a hard place to be. Those two images right there is a hard place to be for a 30 year old. So what yeah. is really? that too much? I'd be happy to be there as an 80 year old. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, it'll be interesting as I as I told um, as I told Rose, this house that we uh, are about to close on in Southwest Colorado. Um, it wasn't the only great feature about it, but it, it has a big garage with this loft area, which will finally give me a lot more room to do, hopefully a little bigger oil painting. So it'll be interesting to see if I can translate any of this into oils. So I'm hoping my hand has been much better in recent years. I still have to be careful with it, but um, Sam, you with your shoulder stuff, you know how it is with pacing yourself when you when you paint. And, um, but I'm, I'm hoping to, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. You'll have to, Rose, you'll have to do a a repeat in another five or 10 years of some of us to see if we've gotten anywhere. Yes, we'll do a follow-up. <laughs> in fewer years than that, we don't have to wait five or 10. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is so wonderful. You can't translate these watercolors to oils. It doesn't matter because the yeah. watercolors are incredible. It's, yeah, truly. Watercolor has its own special quality, that's for sure. Um, I mm. saw, we got the opportunity to see some Turner watercolors. I went to the Tate into the print room in 2000, I think it was 2005. And if you've never, if you've never seen Turner's watercolors in person, I highly recommend it. It just, I, I couldn't believe they were real. They were just so extraordinary and the light, I, I don't know how he did it. I, I just don't know how he did what he did, but um, anyway. You yeah. could have fooled me if you showed me a few of yours, especially at the lake at the end and said they were Turner, I'd say, oh yeah, for sure, that's Turner. <laughs> no, I, sure I, can see, I can see the you. difference. I can see the difference. Oh, um, it's you for sure. At one point I, um, 
I was reading a lot. There's a wonderful two volumes books uh, that Peter Bauer did of Turner's papers. And it's partly a history of his papers, but of what of the manufacture of watercolor paper in the 19th century in England. And it was just a whole art in itself, uh, much of which we've lost uh, the quality of those papers. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting topic in itself. So thank you folks for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you, Elizabeth. Let's do a little virtual round of applause for Elizabeth. Thank you so much for showing thank us your you, work. Elizabeth. This has been oh, so beautiful. special. Thank you, Elizabeth. So it's wonderful. wonderful. Oh, thank and you thank you all so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time to put together such a beautiful presentation and preparing thank for you. it and, and lending your images and your words to us. And we're so appreciative. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. So. Thank oh, this you. has been so great. Um, I'll holidays. leave the Zoom Happy open. Holidays to everybody. Keep on, keep sorry, on. Rose. You're doing great. I say keep oh, on, so keep sweet. on, keeping on. You're doing great. All right. All right. Will do, Sam. Thank and you, thank everybody. you to, to Sam and, and Alan and John to some degree for being patient with my emails when I send you images. That's That's been uh -huh. helpful to me. Oh, we love them. Yeah, they mean the world to us. Incredible. <laughs> really. Don't stop. Thank you. Okay. So inspired. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming, Thank Karen. You all. Bye bye. Thank you so much, everybody. So good to see you. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye, bye Rose. Have fun in Wales. Bye. Rose. Yes. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye, Barry. Bye, John. Okay.